My name is Hunter Newby. I'm the founder and CEO of Allied Fiber. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thanks to the uh, New York Internet Society for uh, inviting me to speak again. It's my fourth time, and I do enjoy it. Uh, so I'm going to give you an overview on Allied Fiber. And actually, uh, I find this um, sort of serendipitous that I get to come up here and speak after my good friend Srihari Pandit. Um, and we find ourselves both doing something very similar. Um, Shihari and I first met uh, in the late 90s at 60 Hudson Street when I was just getting started with uh, Telex and he was just getting started with Stealth and um, Shihari became a tenant of mine at Telex uh, at 60 Hudson um, and we've built a few things together uh, over the years, the voice peering fabric, the Big Apple peering exchange, uh, etc. And we're continuing to work together. Um, on different things that you saw in the slides prior. Uh, Trihari was showing 325 Hudson Street and he mentioned my name a couple of times. So in my personal private life, I'm an investor and I buy carrier hotels with uh, real estate partners. And I've bought a few pretty important buildings here in the US recently. Uh, one of them is 325 Hudson Street here in New York. Um, not that I'm up here to talk about that, but I just wanted to make reference to it since Trihari brought it up. And um, the Allied Fiber system, as I'm about to get into, will eventually have a presence in New York, and I'd say there's a pretty good chance that um, it'll have a presence at 325 Hudson Street. So anyway, as an overview of Allied Fiber, you see here two images, basically, one superimposed upon the other. One is what we call the superstructure, which is the routing around the United States, and the other embedded in that is the cartoon. You probably can't see the whole cartoon image uh, exactly. But um, the cartoon basically depicts, in a general sense, the various network elements that uh, comprise the Allied Fiber system. So there's a submarine cable landing point, which is that sort of brown little building with two blocks on the water part and the, the cartoon in the middle. And then you see two, two lines, a blue line and a red line. There's an express cable, and uh, then there's a local lane. Um, those are for basically two different fiber cables. Uh, and then the first little building to the right from the subsea landing point, that would be an allied fiber co-location facility, which I'll get into uh, explaining a little bit more detail. Um, and then you've got a cell tower, and then you see the two lines go through a carrier hotel there. That would be representative of a building like a 325 Hudson or one Wilshire or the Weston building or the Knapp in Miami or whatever. And then you've got uh, smaller buildings, um, enterprise, schools, hospitals, sheriff's departments, Etc. See the little stubs on, on the outside of the red line? Those are uh, access points to uh, handholds. And a handhold is a physical junction point on the fiber cable that's buried. Um, and that's for splicing on a lateral basis. And essentially, the three elements that, that we, we have are the fiber itself, the allied fiber colo facilities, and the handholds. Our handholds in the state of Florida, which is down there in the blue which is built now, uh, are spaced every 5,000 feet. Um, and then north of Jacksonville, the handholds are every 3,000 feet. That just has to do with the right-of-way deals and the railroads that we've worked with. Um, but in any case, the superstructure here uh, depicts, we call it a ring. Obviously, it's railroad right-of-way, so this is a very specific route. This is actually the right-of-way. So that's been determined since the Civil War in most cases. Um, but it connects the submarine cable landing regions in the U.S. So you have the transatlantic up in the New York area, uh, the, the LATAM South American cable systems between Boca Raton, which is sort of represented by the Miami dot, um, and North Miami and Hollywood, and then, of course, Jacksonville, where there's two new submarine cable systems being built presently. And then out on the West Coast, you've got the Pacific Northwest, um, which is the Nandona Beach and Puget Sound cables that land basically in Hillsborough and, and go back into Seattle and Portland. And then in uh, Southern California, um, you've got Grover Beach, uh, San Luis Obispo, Hermosa, and uh, they go into one Wilshire. So basically, these are the bookends of the U.S., and this is how the world works at the physical layer. Um, the subsea systems land there. They connect, and they crisscross the country. Presently, there is no system like Allied Fiber in the United States. I'm not a carrier. I don't sell lit services. I'm in the real estate business. So strictly dark fiber and strictly neutral colo in my own buildings every 60 miles. And I sell fiber and colo to any network operator that wants it. So I'll begin with 
safe harbor. No, you don't need that. That's for somebody else. That's when I'm out raising money. I'm not doing that today. I'm going to give you some industry basics. I'm going to cover who I am, who's Allied Fiber, what the big picture is, what are we building now, and then what's next. And then we can get into some Q&A. Some real basic things. Um, I don't need to go into great detail here with you guys on this, but I will point out just a couple of things. Um, not, not all fiber networks are created equal, and that largely is due to the fact that fiber as a term is sort of overused and abused. Uh, a lot of people believe wrongly that there's a fiber glut in the United States, and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the fiber that's out in the long haul in the United States is all carrier owned, 100 um, percent. Therefore, by definition, it means it's not carrier neutral, which means that it's not available for lease or IRU on reasonable rates, terms, and conditions. What does that mean? If you can't get access to the dark fiber and light it yourself, then you're subjected to buying lit service, which means that you can never get to the same cost per bit and control that the owner of that fiber can. And in the long haul in the United States, it's owned by a single digit few network operators, mostly the incumbents. So that's a very constrictive thing for any country, and it limits uh, GDP growth, period, full stop. Um, Network neutrality, and I've been using the term carrier neutral since the late 90s uh, when we created Telex at 60 Hudson Street. Um, but net neutrality has become a popular term. And uh, again, uh, the use of words and terms that have really no meaning, they're either uh, intentionally confusing or they're just you know, repeated and parroted by the blissfully ignorant that don't understand what they mean. Net neutrality is not um, internet neutrality, it's network neutrality. And the distinction there in those two terms, network and internet, really comes down to access to me. So network neutrality is about access to the internet. It's not about the internet. And uh, as Srihari mentioned, and I'll repeat, what I'm about to describe to you, you have to bifurcate consumers and users and everyone else, so network operators. Um, consumers are hostages to service providers that provide them service. And you can only be free if you can bypass that control and get to a neutral interconnection point. So it's really not practical or feasible for an individual using a mobile phone to think that they could build their entire own mobile phone and mobile phone network to not have to be subjected to a mobile phone provider. Um, but a network operator, and that again is a very general broad term, um, a network operator, for example, not a carrier or a service provider, but uh, a content company, a bank, a gaming, whatever, um, you know, NYU. NYU could get dark fiber from Trihari, lease it here in Manhattan, come on over to 325 Hudson Street, set up its own DWDM, its own Ethernet switch, its own router, and could directly connect to any network at once. The, uh, using internet protocol, not the internet, and directly pass IP packets to another IP network. There's no internet at all involved in any of that, and there, there's no uh, access provider other than Trihari who'd be provisioning dark fiber in this instance. So then therefore there are no active elements. So that means that there's no metering, there's no deep packet inspection, there's no blocking, there's no discrimination, there's no net neutrality. It's gone, it doesn't exist. So net neutrality only exists for those that allow themselves to be subjected to it in the network operator world. And the difference between being subjected to it and not is simply enlightenment and then physical access. Once you know, you need to know where to go and then you need to know how to get there. And if that path doesn't exist, someone needs to build it. But if it does exist or a little piece maybe is missing and you build that extension, then you can get into a system like Triharis or a system like Allied Fiber on a national basis. Essentially at the dark fiber level we're doing the same thing. The only thing that I do that's different is that light over a great distance needs to be amplified, which is why I add those buildings. And I make those buildings neutral and I open them up to the local market. So I can have every local muni network and cable company, wireless provider and so on come into that system and access all the long haul providers, the superstructure, the PTTs, the subsea networks, the IXEs, etc. And the content providers. Um, at the physical layer, when you create a new system like that, it creates an environment of openness. And as long as the rules that govern that infrastructure are based upon fairness, 
equality and openness. There's no need to go any further. Um, and the rules that the FCC, well, whatever the net neutrality rules were or aren't or are being changed to is necessarily irrelevant outside of the physical air system that we're creating because our rules are created by us and they're, we're self-governed in a sense. I don't need a carrier license to do what I do because I don't sell that service. I'm strictly real estate. So that sort of uh, protects me from all the other things that go on outside of my walls. So that's what I think of when I think of neutrality. And then what is a meet me room? It's been around for a while. It's kind of a common term. I, I don't know if I created it or heard somebody say it, but I really branded it um, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, I am a builder and developer of meet me rooms. That's what I do. And I build these facilities. And I now, with Allied Fiber, physically distribute them around the United States. And I also buy, again, as my private personal self, I invest with partners and buy carrier hotels. And in those buildings, we build meet me rooms. And those are the safe, neutral havens for systems like my own on the Allied side to find and interconnect in within those markets. So here's a little bit about the cartoon and some details about Allied Fiber. Allied Fiber is building the first integrated network neutral co-location and dark fiber company, okay? And when I say integrated, I mean neutral colos, which are essentially the op-amp ILA regen facilities of the legacy IXE networks. But since I'm not a carrier, my buildings are neutral meet-me rooms, and they're spaced every 60 miles on purpose because that's the distance that light travels in fiber before it needs to be amplified. So there's a wonderful real estate business inherent in what I'm doing, and it's dictated by physics. I didn't just pull that out of the air. And optics, and it depends on what lasers you use. You can use erbium dope pump lasers and go 180 miles. But the traditional spacing is about 100 kilometers, 60 miles. And then, therefore, anybody that's buying a fiber pair from me on a 20-year IRU necessarily needs to take space and power from me in my building. It just happens to be that I own the building. They don't have to go find it themselves, so it's convenient. And that's a nice way for me to charge them rent every month for 20 years. So, um, so this fiber optic system offers the combined long-haul, short-haul capabilities coupled with these neutral colo facilities. The short-haul, again, is that sort of metro distribution network. So what in a metro is referred to as a manhole, I refer to as a handhole. And I've got some pictures to show you of what that actually is. But that's for lateral splicing for folks that do fiber to the tower for wireless backhaul or MSOs or any kind of muni network or LEX or private networks or government networks or all of the above, which we're dealing with all of it in Florida presently. So it provides for direct access to towers, rural broadband service providers, enterprise government, et cetera. So this platform, again, think of this design on a national basis, enables distributed cloud computing. So in order to distribute the cloud, you have to actually have a physical platform to distribute it on. And as Srihari mentioned, it's best served if the underlying infrastructure is not owned by a carrier, but is actually neutral. And since we pass through multiple jurisdictions, I deal with railroads. I'd rather not have to deal with municipalities and governments for a variety of different reasons. It's too much paperwork. There's too many underlying rights issues to deal with. I cut a deal with Norfolk Southern Railroad, which is effectively 35 years. Okay, so I have one landlord that covers pretty much everything east of the Mississippi, down to Florida, one landlord. They have their own police department. They're a sovereign nation. And once you get on the other side of that wall, it's a really nice, cozy place to be. It's kind of difficult to get through the wall, but once you're on the other side, it's good. Um, distributed cloud is really important. And it really, just think of it as CDN or edge cache or, or cloud or whatever. Um, it's the, the servers and server clusters that are clustered in sort of places on the, in the United States. It gets too much from a single point of failure, but also from a, uh, a congestion perspective of processing. So you have latency issues and throughput issues and whatnot. And video over mobile really ultimately doesn't work um, without LTE, which is something else we'll talk about, or some other wireless technology. Uh, but it also, it doesn't work effectively if you can't cache most of the content closer to where the devices are. And the Allied Fiber System enables that distribution. You'll notice on the far left, there's a modular container data center. And it's stuck right there, like a little Lego. And I did that on purpose. 
The Allied Fiber Co-location facilities are meet-me rooms. These are layer one, two interconnect points. They're meant for dense wave, core ethernet, and core routing. That's it. They're not meant for servers. They don't have the power or cooling profile for that. They're meet-me rooms. The power and cooling profile for a data center is found in the modular containerized data center. And there's about 50 different providers of those things today. IBM, HP, Dell, whatever. Seroscale, IO, uh, Compass. A lot of my friends are in that business. So I encourage them to deploy their product along our route because it's designed to have things appended to it and they can find cheap power and land and obviously access the dark fiber, which nothing could be better. And now you can incrementalize computing and distribute it. So that's a very important dimension of what Ally Fiber does, enables. So again, as I said, it improves latency, QoS, throughput, and control. The operative word here is control. People ask me, why are you doing this? And I say, well, because there's demand. And then people say, well, who would want to buy dark fiber? And I said, well, the fiber that's out there is already being used by multiple network operators. There happens to be more network operators on the content side, non-carrier, being born every day. And they all want control. So you know, if you think of the, if you think of the over-the-top providers, the content folks that are having issues today with the whole net neutrality access thing, if they could get their own fiber paths, they wouldn't have that problem. OK, there's the answer to the question of why we're doing it. And really, this last bullet, which is the thing that I think about the most, dark fiber infrastructure, and this is generic, by the way, but think about it as it applies to the United States. Dark fiber infrastructure is the basis for economic development and GDP growth, period. I don't care where you are in the world. And I deal a lot with the World Bank and IFC and they're funding infrastructure projects exactly like this in every other country but the United States. Because they say that the United States is rich and we're a first world nation. And I have to remind them that the United States is comprised of multiple third world nations and we are an emerging market. Okay? And, and you know, it, it pains me to have conversations with these guys. Um, and don't get me on my fiat currency soapbox, but they all deal in dollars, and they're handing out dollars to the rest of the world. I think they should worry about the dollar's value coming out of the US. Um, and if we don't build infrastructure like this, we won't get to the GDP growth that all those other countries they're funding will. Um, and it's a problem because of our geography. We're a very big country, whereas we're being compared to a lot of smaller countries by the OECD, which is unfair. We're 20 something on the list of broadband speeds and penetrations. But when you're compared to Belgium and Luxembourg, I mean, that's a joke. Luxembourg is this auditorium compared to the United States. Um, anyway, give you a little uh, statistics here. Maybe you can't really read all this, but David, feel free to give this to anybody that wants it afterwards. Um, I really break out right here the two main products, fiber leasing and co-location. And you can see how we generate money. OK, this is a real estate business. Now, in the old days, the fiber, dark fiber IRUs, that was not a business, OK? It was not thought through. All the original IXCs that raised high yield during the bubble had to start selling off fiber assets to make high yield note payments, OK? It was a slash and burn last ditch effort to stave off Chapter 11, which all of them failed to do except level three, which retrospectively they probably should have, but that's a whole nother story over drinks. Um, we generate IRU cash by selling the fibers on a 20-year basis, but then that is what seeds the colo business, which is the dimension that none of the legacy IXCs had because they're not neutral. The colo business is leasing rack space. So once you sell out all the fiber and the cables, and again, that's theoretical. I'll always go get more ducks, and I'll always be able to pull out old cables and do deals and things like that. But the initial cable, you sell it out. You generate all your upfront cash. That helps you pay for the construction. And then you start to put the equipment in the op-amp regen colo facilities. And more equipment comes, and more equipment comes, and more equipment comes. And they just keep taking more space and power. And they keep paying more rent. And that just grows and grows. That's the telex business model. That's what I already did. And that's working really well and was highly successful. Just that left side is the legacy afterthought of the dark fiber business that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s. When you combine the two, it's something no one's ever seen before. It's a business that funds its own construction and then creates a 20 year or more annuity on the real estate side. And as long as you don't screw up 
the open access neutral environment within the colo facility, it's forever. That's basically what I wanted to show you there. So this is what we refer to as the diverse network operator universe, okay? These are just network operator types that exist out there in the world and what their motivations are for purchasing dark fiber. You might not be able to read all of it, but you're all smart people. You're here in this room, right? I would say the one word that you can sort of underpin every single one of these is control. They're all experiencing enormous, massive, explosive growth. And in many cases, these network operators know that their own success will kill them if they can't get control of their costs, particularly the enterprise folks. And there's a lot of banks and insurance companies I just couldn't fit the logos of on here, but they know all too well that as they transform their businesses to being network-based businesses, their consumption of capacity is quadrupling. And that means that their OPEX is quadrupling. And they can't compensate for that. So they want dark fiber, and they go seek it. And when they seek it here in the United States, they don't find it. It either doesn't exist, or it's owned by someone who won't sell it to them. Or it's so old it can't be used, or it's aerial, or it's whatever. And then they call me. And then they look at what we're building, and they say, this is amazing. This is the answer. All right, I need to buy fibers from you in the whole ring right now. And I say, but it's not built. And then they go panic, white, and they're like, what are you talking about? They're like, when's it going to be done? I said, it'll probably take five to seven years. That's if I got all the money today and I had no obstructions. And they're shocked. I said, well, if you don't believe me, ask yourself the question. Have you been out trying to find dark fiber? Yes. Have you found it? No. There's the answer. And they're petrified out of their minds. So I started this company in 2008. I thought that that was enough lead time for everybody to get on board. Everybody's been the ostrich with the head in the sand. And now it's 2014. And a lot of the underlying dirt rights of the existing IXC fibers the dirt rights are expiring, OK? That's a big problem. You got to renew rights with railroads for 20 years. That's a big check you got to write. A lot of these network operators don't want to write it or don't have the money. So we're running into a, a bit of an issue here in the US in terms of national infrastructure. Well, a little bit about the evolution of Allied Fiber. Like I mentioned, I formed the company in June of 2008. And you could just sort of bounce through this. Um, I raised the first capital for the business in uh, January 2009, um, which is funny. I raised two and a half million bucks then, so to date I've raised 50 million. Um, and that's like chump change <laughs> compared to what's necessary to build this thing out. Got the NS right of way deal done. Right of way, that's it. This is all about right of way. If you don't have the right, you're toast. It's like ECS, it's like building penetrations here in the city. You can build whatever you want, but if you can't get that last foot, it won't happen. Um, so the right-of-way agreement was essential for me. Anyway, as you move through, you see we had a bunch of different milestones. We, we executed you know, major agreements with MSOs and RBOX. And we went down to Florida and bought a duct from Florida East Coast Railroad, which is the Miami to Jacksonville uh, duct that we used to build that system. So it sort of brings you up to date. And we still have a ways to go. So what's the big picture? Again, there's a bunch of slides that show that everything's just exploding. The one thing I like to point out here, um, mobile data traffic, worldwide cloud, et cetera. These arrows don't get out into the outer years, the 2017s, 2020s, unless there's infrastructure behind it to support it. And we're basically all tapped out of infrastructure here in the US right now. A lot of these guys in the long haul are trying to go 100 gig. And they're having problems because of the type of fiber that they've got and the age and the core mismatch and the lack of infrastructure facilities for them to deploy their equipment in. And that's the guys that own the glass. Forget about everybody else that wants to build their own national network and can't even get fiber. So capacity constraints start at layer one, layer zero technically. Um, but anyway, this is a really good driver and slides for justification and model for why we're building allied fiber. And uh, I like this slide a lot because, and I got to thank Rosemary Cochran at uh, Vertical Systems Group for this. 
Um, she pulled out uh, the statistics of how many commercial office buildings actually have fiber in the United States. And by the way, this statistic is driven by fiber alone, just the word fiber, which means it's carrier-owned fiber sort of mixed in here. Um, and this is now, you know, in 12. So what she told me when I saw her in Denver a couple months ago is that it's, it's up to like about 40% or so. But that still leaves 60% of commercial office buildings in the United States without any dark fiber. Actually, if I use the term dark fiber, the percentage is probably a lot higher because, again, dark fiber is available for lease. Fiber is carrier-owned fiber, which means, yeah, it's fiber, but they're going to sell you a 100 meg circuit for whatever price they decide. Um, so this isn't a true dark fiber representation, but still, this isn't that great. Um, and if you extrapolate out the time that it took even to get to this point, it'd take another 18 years uh, for the U.S. to reach 95% penetration of just carrier fiber in all the office buildings. 18 years. And that's assuming no new office buildings were built in that time frame. That's bad. So all this fiber gap creates a big compelling opportunity for allied fiber. And again, we're dealing with this industry issues and really geographic issues for the country itself. Um, the U.S. is a large country, so it's going to cost a lot of money to build, and nobody really wants to do it. Carriers don't want to do it. Everybody's looking for somebody else to sell them fiber that they already have. Everybody wants to pass the buck. Nobody wants to spend the capex to build the infrastructure because ultimately they only want, like what, four fibers, maybe a ribbon? So who's going to do it? Who's going to go out and get the right of way? Who's going to build the infrastructure? Who's going to manage the colos? Got to be neutral, right? Nobody wants to do it. We've been running on fumes on what's out there now. The incumbents haven't built anything new long haul in the U.S. in over a decade. There's been three new generations of fiber in that time. All the new optics that are coming out today have been trialed on the new fiber that's been made within the last three years. But none of that fiber is actually deployed long haul in the U.S. That's a big problem. We have capacity constraints. We have carrier control conflicts. And we've got technological obsolescence. Those are just a few of the challenges the industry faces. Allied fiber addresses all of them. Now, here's one thing we don't do. We don't do everything, OK? I don't solve everybody's problems. I don't wave a magic wand and just say, yeah, no problem. Whatever your problem is, I, I solved it. We don't build to towers. We don't build to buildings. We don't build to hospitals or whatever. But we provide a platform that's open for people to build to us. That's the point of the handholds for splicing. And then our colo, every 60 miles, is like taking a carrier neutral meet me room from a major city making it modular, incrementalizing it, and distributing it every 60 miles along the route so that the whole country can have access to their own close, near, private, neutral meet point. Makes things kind of convenient. Makes the country a smaller place. That's the fun thing about the physical layer. So I got some dark fiber statistics in here of who uses it and, and why and what. And again, it comes down to control. But if you just look at the upper right-hand corner, there are options for obtaining bandwidth. Really what you want to do um, as, an, as a network entity that's consuming a lot of capacity is ultimately move to your own dark fiber. So I'll, I'll sort of make reference back to Srihari on this one. There are probably entities in New York that are just capacity constrained, capacity exhaust, they're dying. And then Srihari hopefully can get into their building and sell them a circuit. And they'll probably buy a gig to start. And their business will grow and they'll say, hey, can we move this to 10 gig? Yeah, sure, no problem. And can we get you know, 20 gig? Can we get 40 gig? And then at some point, when they start to look at how much they're paying for that, they'd say, you know what? If we could just get our own dark fiber, we could buy equipment from this vendor over here, and then we could control it. Probably the cost about break even at whatever the cost per bit is when they run the numbers in their head. And then they say, but the benefit is that from whatever that break even threshold is, now we can add capacity when we want just by going into the network management system. And it's at no additional cost unless you need to pop a new card in the box. But really, what is that ultimately going to cost? It's incremental. Now, Srihari is probably cool with that. He's probably like, hey, you want to go from 10 gig to 100 gig, and you're doing some really weird, wacky stuff, and you want your own fiber pair? No problem. Here, I'll just lease you the dark fiber. That needs to exist in every city in the United States. And those cities and those counties and those towns need to connect to a superstructure that allows the free thoroughfare of all that traffic on an equal basis, physical air, real estate. So between myself, the macro, and Srihari here, the New York City micro, you combine the two, and there you go. Expand on it. 
So what are we building now? Here we go. Got to the good stuff. So we built a 364 route mile system from Miami to Jacksonville. Again, subsea landings down in Boca and then on up to Jacksonville, connecting all the systems that come up out of Latin America, South America. So we're connecting continents and this is the first leg. But remember, it's the same model everywhere we go. We just keep repeating the same. The cartoon just keeps getting repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, it's on FEC. It's completely underground. We will never build any aerial cable. We can't. Our customers won't accept it, um, which is fine. Uh, we have handles every 5,000 feet in Florida, like I said. Uh, we're providing access on the local side for rural broadband and you know muni networks and everything under the sun. I think all of it's really great and cool and I dig it, but I don't really care. I'm kind of agnostic to it. To me, it's all just real estate. It's an entrance. It's a rack. Somebody wants to lease a fiber repair. Great. You want to cross connect to that guy? Okay, terrific. Um, and then obviously the colos is what ties it all together. You can see the little blue dots. That's where our colos are. I particularly like that West Palm Beach colo because I go down to Palm Beach and I stay at the Breakers. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a beautiful place. You've got to check it out. We'll have a party down there. Everybody can come. All right? And I'll let you all in. We'll do a tour. So then we've already built 150 miles of the Georgia segment. That was for a customer. We had a wireless backhaul opportunity with, with them and they had it with the mobile operator. Um, so that leaves about 150 miles or so uh, to complete, and then we've got to build five new buildings and drop them uh, to get up to Atlanta. That's our next build, which we're going to embark upon shortly. So here's some pictures. Um, Trihari had pictures, so I've got pictures. The top right picture there is a picture of the Allied Fiber Colo, the modular building being dropped in Fort Pierce, Florida. Um, so that building is 1,200 square feet, it holds about 60 racks, and that's the same exact building you see every 60 miles. That guy's standing in a handhole. Remember I mentioned the handholes? That's a splice point, and you can see that backhoe right there is excavating one of the handholes out. And you can see some more of the work, the guy's in a handhole there, and some of the details about the Florida construction. Some more pictures. So each of those units, that one that's hanging in the air right there, that's 70,000 pounds. Uh, they're all Hurricane 5 rated. Uh, they're all AC, UPS, 120 volt, negative uh, 48 DC, redundant generator back, neutral facilities. You can see the handhole there that's open. The duct is in there. Um, jetting. That was in Brunel, Florida, up near Daytona Beach. I was there for both of these. And you can see the, the little tractor there pushing the dirt over the handhole. There's a little timeline on our construction. All that is to say that it takes time to build infrastructure, OK? <laughs> These things don't get turned up like VLANs. You got to actually dig holes in the ground and put fiber in. Oh, yeah, I always like to tell people, you talk about the cloud, that's the cloud right down there under the ground. And then what's next? We're going to build Georgia. And then we're going to build the superstructure. And uh, like I told somebody here earlier today, I'm always raising money. I'm always looking for lower cost of capital, access to capital. Um, but we have a sort of a rinse repeat type business model. It works everywhere we go. Uh, it just keeps repeating the same process. Thank you. I'll take questions if people have questions. Yep. I'm wondering why the uh, railroads didn't want to give you all the money you needed. Well, that's a good question, but they're not in this business. And actually, I got to thank Norfolk Southern and uh, a couple people over there that invested a lot of money in the 90s to put the duct in the ground that I went back and essentially acquired from them. And for that, if that's all that they ever did, I thank them. They saved me, you know, untold millions. Um, but it's not their business. And they look at me as filling a void because a lot of people come to them and ask for fiber and then say they want to build what we're building, but they don't. They then look at it and go, oh my God, that's not what we are. We don't want to build all that infrastructure. We just want a few fibers in a rack every so often for amplification. So that's, that's the spot that we fill. And the railroad is our landlord. R railroads are landlords, essentially. Um, even though there's trains and they're moving coals and car and stuff like that, they're really about land. Um, so we're using the land um, to perfect it in a way to position it for network operators. That's all. And they enjoy the fact that we do that. So anytime people call them up and ask, they say, just call Allied Fiber. So it's nice. Yes? I found that in Washington, the secret intelligence world is clueless about big data and dark fiber, and the NSF is impotent. Is there any point in Washington where they might understand what you're saying? 
It depends on who we're talking to. Is there anyone in Washington that you talk to that gets it? Yes, but they can't do much about it yet. There's other things happening in Washington right now that are distracting. Yes. Okay, we, we have one speaker lined up who has to leave shortly. If we, okay. could, if we could pop him in. Yep. And then um, Bruce and Clayton would speak, and, and their stuff is relevant to yours. Sure. And then maybe we could bring you all back for a panel and, and do um, a deeper Q&A after That's that. A great Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you.